my name is Rachel and today I'm talking about The Sun in Its Shade. This is the sequel to The Night in Its Moon. I did review both the self-published version and the traditionally published version and if you would like to have context for what I'm going to tell you happened in the Sun in its shade and my review on it, then I suggest watching either one of those videos. You can watch both if you want, but if you want to know like plot wise where we're at, I would recommend watching. I was not going to do this video publicly. I was going to make this patrons only. But come on, these views. And I had put on Goodreads a review that said one line. It said, review to come, but please note that reviews are not for authors and their friends. And I got an email yesterday from Goodreads, put it here, and it says that it was removed for talking about the author, which doesn't make sense because all I did was assert a boundary, which I have been trying to do this entire time. <laughs> to no success. <laughs> that got reported and removed completely for saying I'm going to review the book and that reviews are for readers. So that one line got removed. So I'm going to review it publicly instead because it's quite clear to me what <laughs> that no matter what I do, it's a problem. So I'm just going to do my job, get paid and uh, continue to read and review books. Okay? All right, let's move on. Where we left off in the last book is these two people these two women, Knox and Amaris. Knox is here, Amaris is here, okay? Knox and Amaris are two people who grew up in an orphanage together and Knox is in love with Amaris and pines after her but they got separated when they were like I think 15 and 17 if I remember correctly. Knox was forced to go work at a brothel in Amaris's place essentially and Amaris went off with a guy who was basically Geralt from The Witcher. She went off to a place under that is like within a mountain to learn about fighting and potions and gin and she has a scar across her face so she's basically Siri from The Witcher and that was one of my big complaints about the last book is how many parallels to The Witcher that there were. <laughs> that was a big complaint of mine. I was hoping that that would sort of be fixed in the traditionally published version and it was not. Um, everything that I had issue with, issues with with Knox was regarding her race I felt was um, not appropriate. It didn't get fixed in the traditionally published version and that was unfortunate. At the end Knox who is also a succubus, uh, does some weird shit to a serial killer man and then uh, finds Amaris but they're separated by a prison gate and they kiss and she tells Amaris she loves her and then Amaris has to go fight a basically a dragon with not Rhysand from Akatar who is uh, also fan casted as a South Asian person. We go, we fight the dragon, then they they board the dragon much like that scene in Harry Potter. Her and not Rhysand board the dragon and fly off to a uh, university. And Nox ends up with uh, fellow not witchers that that we're traveling with Amaris. That's the best recap I can give you. If you need more than that, you're gonna have to go watch the other video because it's just like, it's too much to do a recap on. This book itself really needed sort of a recap in the beginning. And the reason why is because while so much happened, it was just stuff and not necessarily plot. And because there were no big plot moments, you really have to have like some kind of callback to, to give the reader a reminder when <laughs> that you don't have like these big plot moments that, that really stand out. Oh, and the reason that Amaris was in prison is because there is a queen that she was meant to go talk to who is, she put some sort of spell on that made it so that everybody from the not South Asian country appears to be demons and so Amaris went to go talk to that queen and the prince and she's like where's the prince? Queen says prince is right there. Amaris says there's nobody sitting in that chair because the prince was an illusion and only Amaris could see through it. So she's like okay the prince's parents are dead but the prince is also gone and she got put in jail and then had to fight a dragon. Oh man I have so many I highlighted so much stuff. Great. Fantastic. So Knox is hanging out with Amaris's friends. We open and uh, Knox is having a dream about her and Amaris, which they have. All of their relationship is really just centered around dreams that they've had of each other. Well, I was having a rather lovely dream, which then turned into a nightmare. There were naked women in both parts. The first one was loving, tender, very generous. Because they're like connected by dreams. Kind of like a Kylo Ren and Rey situation going on, where they're like dreaming about each other and they like can actually touch and feel each other, but they're not actually there. And Knox is said to smell like cinnamon, cardamom, and pepper. You smell of death and destiny. It's onion. By Amaris. 
which is interesting because aren't those seasonings usually used in South Asian cuisine? I thought we talked about in, you know, the review community, which I realize is vilified, about not referring to people of color as food, but all right. Anyway, Nox smelled like dark spices and the sweet ripe fruit they would had the chance to try on rare occasions. She'd also stated more than once that it was the best smell in the world, better than baked bread or perfume or chocolate. So much food. Nox is just like a friggin' buffet, I guess. Just feels like further uh, dehumanization of her, which the last book was pretty rife with. And they have a conversation and Nox is thinking she'd done all she could to help the snowflake. She does in fact call uh, Amaris her snowflake. Too small, too delicate for the cruelties of the world as she'd been dragged into the Colosseum. But Amaris hadn't been fragile. She hadn't been powerless or defenseless. She was nothing like the snowflake Nox had known. She was someone Nox didn't know. Not anymore. No shit. Y'all haven't seen each other in like 10 years. And I feel like there wasn't enough actually uh, like foundation of them at the orphanage. We got a few scenes, but it was mostly just this is how Nox felt. This is how Nox felt about Amaris. By the way, Nox feels this about Amaris, but it's never on page seeing that. That was never cultivated. It's just the author telling us that that's how Knox feels. And I'm like, cool, but like, you gotta, you gotta do that. You gotta do that in action. Otherwise it's just like, it, it just feels like something that you made up that you never actually created. Oh shit. By the way, I need to note this. I have an ARC copy, an ER copy from the publisher. Um, I did ask somebody who has read the finished version, if any, I, I noted like big like points. I was like, did all of this happen? She said yes. But I don't know if anything changed from advanced reader copy to published version. So lines that I might bring up in this might have changed because I didn't go line by line with her. So I don't know if anything's different. You might have a published copy and it might be different. And the reason why is because I have an advanced reader copy, which I applied for back in September. And had I known what was going to happen, I never would have applied for it. But now I don't care. I'm just gonna do my job. It's a lot of the descriptive writing that I just don't jive with here. Like uh, chapter one starts out, there is a metallic scent to blood, one Amaris recognized instantly. Okay. I mean, okay, <laughs> sure. The iron rust and salt left its tang in the air as it exited in slow, methodical drops. I'm like, okay, all right. Listen, I know you really want to write like this very verbose prose, but let's just, let's just get into it. Because what, <sighs> it's hard for me to describe when a book feels effortless versus when it feels like a, an author really tried very hard to write beautiful prose. Again, I'm going to call back to Lainey Taylor and Sylvia Moreno Garcia who do it very effortlessly, but there's something about a way a line is written where I can tell that it's trying too hard, whereas Lainey Taylor and Sylvia Moreno Garcia, I can tell just think that way, where everything is very flowery and lyrical and beautiful, And but this it's like, I'm going to try to emulate that rather than I'm not going to try to sit here and create my own way of doing that, because the way that Lainey Taylor writes, if you pull it out and, and have me read it to you, I can tell it's Lainey Taylor, or I can tell it's Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Garcia because it's very distinct to that author. Same with like C.S. Lewis. This just feels like it's trying to be one of those. And this isn't the only example, like it's the whole book is like that. I complained about this in the last book where it's like, there's a word for the space between things, but the word has been lost or forgotten. And it's like, stop it. Stop it. I was really surprised that that passed through an editor, but now I am no longer surprised. Monster Energy, please sponsor me. Okay, so there's blood because her and Gadriel, not Resan, we're fighting a dragon and he is really fucked up. His wings are all shredded. He has like raven type wings, not bat wings. That's why he's not Resan. They end up, they ended up at the university, right? Oh my god, this book is long for no reason. Okay, so it says um, he's all fucked up, but she was alive, but that's all she knew. Her head was no longer sharp and clear. She was okay, but no longer a human girl of flesh and life and joy. She was made of ice and stone. She was a statue chiseled from the slab she now rested on, just as Umriv had been hewn from its granite mountain. Okay, it's too much. Like, it doesn't need to... They're, ah! Also, she was okay is, is so weird. <laughs> it just feels like... <laughs> it just 
feels like weirdly anachronistic but not exactly but like he, you couldn't think of another word but okay but like you didn't need to think of any other words because you have basically the same idea over and over and over and I know that this has been pointed out in other reviews which are obviously getting read so the fact that this is continuing is just like clearly we don't actually care about reader feedback here oh I'm gonna have to take that out that was too snarky she realizes that the university has not resan Gadriel who is appearing to them because of the curse as an agimni? Agimni? Agimni. We're gonna go with agimni. No, agimni. It's an agimni, okay? So he looks like a demon. Like a wraith-like, I don't know, creepy, black, skeletonish wraith-like thing. <laughs> And so uh, this entire university is filled with like scholars and doctors and stuff, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. <laughs> How are we gonna play that off seeing as like most um, fantasy is written to be like around 14th, 15th century-ish as far as like knowledge and discovery and invention, right? So when they say things like a guy comes in and he lifted a small white fey light to Amaris's eyes and she winced. Good, good, your pupils are showing great cognitive function. I'm like, <laughs> I don't see how this is possible. I don't know. Again, I grew up funny. My education was shit, so maybe, maybe that's somehow possible. Okay, and I know, like, you're thinking, it's a fantasy world, but the problem is that, like, anachronisms really take me out of the story because I start to think, okay, well, if this is possible, then shouldn't X, Y, and Z be possible? And then I start to think of how, like, how many gaps in my knowledge of the world are and how there is no explanation for how certain things are working and certain things are understood but certain things are not. This is just how how my brain works and how a lot of readers brain works so that's why anachronisms suck and you have to account for them. Same with like she gets some food from these people and they're like she says do you have any salt and they said salt isn't very good for your blood pressure. I'm pretty sure the blood pressure was not discovered until like 17th 18th century so I don't know that just feels weird like as well as there's another line in here that that calls somebody a psychopath which is another thing that was not coined that's a term that wasn't coined until almost 1900 like that that kind of stuff just does not make sense in a world set like this which is clearly supposed to be similar to the witcher which is similar to like 14th 15th century so she tries to convince these people hey my friend Gadriel I know he appears to you as an agimni agimni but he's not he's a person he's from Roscott so Ta-da. But they, in like the, basically the zoology department, really want to experiment on him. Oh, yeah. She actually says, try not to get angry at what I'm about to say, but I'm pretty sure they want to keep you in their zoo to study you as their first live demon specimen. Alexa, when was the term zoo coined? From treehugger.com. The word zoo was coined in the 1840s by the London Zoo, which first called itself a zoological garden. So why didn't we just come up with a not 18th century term for a zoo? Anyway, if you want to set your book in basically what is like 18th century, it, it just feels lazy to be like, this is sort of 15th, 14th century, but I want all the technological, te technological advances of the 18th, 19th century. Why didn't you just, why didn't you just make this 18th, 19th century and then we could have like fucking guns and shit. It feels a little lazy to do that, to not make up your own lore that makes sense within the world and not have to explain like how you got these these terms coined that came only because we had technological advances. Anyway, that's why anachronisms suck. They want to keep you in their demon zoo. Amaris does this thing where she like internally feels like, oh, I'm so worthless because I didn't do X, Y, Z. And it feels a little bit like the author did not account for why Amaris did not better advocate for herself in the last book. Like Amaris was getting taken away by guards and, and she says, and she didn't like like stick up for herself. She didn't try harder to save herself from ending up in the, <laughs> the situation she did. And she said she'd been dispatched for a single task and had failed in a most spectacular fashion. Not only had she failed to persuade the queen, but she hadn't even possessed the wherewithal to plead for help from the court, the guards, or anything that might have saved them. Utter worthlessness crushed her. Okay. And then it says, what psychopath invented the saying, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And she says, cats should get to keep their fur, which that's actually funny, but psychopath is anachronistic. They talked to somebody named Fehu, who is partly from Roscott, uh, and <laughs> she's, 
<laughs> she's she's like head of the zoology department essentially and she says I see the agenda before me that I am meant to perceive but she basically can hear that Gadriel is talking and she thinks it's because of her northern blood perhaps it's not your presence in Fairhold but merely the act of crossing the border that results in your susceptibility to the enchantment so if this is the case I suspect that if I were le to leave Fairhold's lands and re-enter the curse would not even spare me my assumption is that I too would look like a Jimny to my colleagues and I'm like how has this gone on this long without anybody else figuring this out what? That's a political nightmare. It doesn't make sense. Nobody, nobody figured out. You haven't talked to anybody from Rascot. How do they do like trade and stuff? How do they do anything? And what about like other countries? Are other countries not, is this, they're, they're all not communicating with each other? What? I have so many questions and I'm on book two and they still have not gotten answered. So Knox had basically like, I done some weird shit with this dude's dick where he was a serial killer and so she like put him under her succubus spell basically like slowly castrated him used him because he was captain of the guard to get into the palace she saw Amaris and Amaris got taken away right so Nox is like I really need to go back to the brothel that she was working at by the way Millicent the brothel owner never shows up in this book I didn't really talk about the ableism in the last book of having like a deformity be a sign of like evil it's not great I know a lot of other people have brought that up it's yeah it's it's not good it was pretty shitty in the last book um, Millicent's not in this book at all so I there is none of that here they do go to her office uh, well Knox goes to her office She's traveling with Ash and Malik, Amaris's friends from the Not Witcher school. She comes across Cece, who I do not remember from the last book at all. That's how <laughs> either she wasn't in the last book or that's how like unnecessary she was. She runs into Cece and Cece is there trying to, you know, get some shit because basically they're just like stealing from Millicent, the brothel owner and they CC wants to get rid of her contract well CC said the night after you went to the bird and pony where the serial killer captain the guard was the whole place went to hell guards stormed in here the next morning they practically dragged Millicent out by her hair Knox says why and CC says where have you been under a rock the city was sacked some dragon escaped from the castle and the riots that followed well if I had to guess your head is probably up on the chopping block too and Knox says why basically and CC says every man saw you there that night and saw the captain leave with you they trace the connection to the selkie almost immediately that's what you get for being too good at your job notoriety and reputation apparently the captain acted against the crown immediately after your encounter with him he was a loyal man of service for up to years and then he flips for a traitor the moment he meets a whore there's a story that needs to be followed this feels so wonky <laughs> like so they're just so their idea is that he couldn't have possibly have turned traitor but like wouldn't what <laughs> So they took Millicent away and I guess Millicent is, is gone. I don't know if she's dead. I don't know if she's being questioned. None of that is said here. She says the crown knows, everyone knows, you and Millicent conspired with the captain of the guard against the queen Moiray. It's done with. I don't give a shit. I don't care who you overthrow or what powers you usurp. Conspiring is a treason, is treason and I for, if I were you I'd get out of here. And I'm like, what? So they just like a assumed a conspiracy theory and jumped with it? What? And we're hearing it like third hand? Okay, it just, I don't, I don't, okay. So then Knox, I, this is, I, I will, I will bring up when I actually think that like cool stuff happens. So Knox decides to go through Millicent's office and get some stuff, right? She grabs, you know, normal stuff like a cloak, her walking shoes, and a coin purse. Then she grabbed the only three things she knew to have power. The first was a candle that never grew smaller no matter how long it burned. The second was a pocket watch that didn't tell the time but had an arrow to point a pocket watch. Alexa, when were watches invented? From Makomi.com. The first watch was invented by locksmith and inventor Peter Henlein in Nuremberg, Germany in the year 1505. Oh, huh, alright. She grabs the three things she knows to have power. The first was a candle that never grew smaller. The second was a pocket watch that didn't tell the time but had an arrow to point wherever you wanted to go. The third was an elaborate black quill that could write on any parchment and have its message received anywhere in the world by whoever possessed its matching counterpart. That's really fucking cool. The third one sounds a little familiar, which I'll talk about in a little while, but all three of those are really good ideas. What I wish would have been done here is I wish that we had had an opportunity to have like book of fairy tales that Knox and Amaris both grew up on where those things were in the fairy tales. 
Now, is that a familiar concept? <laughs> yes, but at least it would have added something like a touchstone from their childhood to connect them to their adulthood. And I think that that would have made the story so much richer. I love that idea. I love that Millicent would, we could have made Millicent this person who's like constantly chasing power wherever she can find it, including like, if these are objects that are in real life, she could have been sending girls down to find them. And we wouldn't have even had to have a brothel at all. We wouldn't have even had to have this like really icky depiction of sex work where a woman of color is also a succubus and is also forced to have sex with men who she doesn't want to have sex with, including when she is in a coma and she's only there because she took the place of the white girl. Instead, we could have had this woman who, who creates this like small worker bee hive of women that she sends out to do her bidding so that she can accumulate more power. I like that idea better. Why didn't we have that? Then we didn't have to have the icky sex work that wasn't sex work, it was human trafficking. This is not empowering sex work, it was human trafficking and it was unnecessary. Why? Damn it! Okay, so she gets the cool shit, which I admit is cool shit, right? And then she goes and back to Ash and Malik and she gets them and she looks at them and she says, she found herself starting to wonder if these men might be her friends. You've been with them for like two seconds. What? Uh, the misogyny, again, it doesn't make sense in this world. I don't get it. It, it just does not, it, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's not rooted in anything. Like historically, misogyny is rooted in something, uh, including in religion, which in this world, the religion that most people follow is the religion of the all mother so I just like where what's the historical context for why misogyny exists in this world why patriarchy exists in this world what why anyway they're talking about the the politics of Fairhold the country they're in it says I doubt the fan fanfare would have been nearly so grand if Princess Daphne had borne the kingdom of daughter said Knox but she did more on that later no she thought life was not kind to women they were not celebrated for the grand achievement of being born born with something between their legs. I mean, moving on. She knew, <laughs> she knew more than most that a girl had to find a way to navigate the dangers of this world, whether it was through Amara's branding swords or Nox's charm and intellect, lest she be chewed up and spit out by the continent. The whole continent? So the whole continent is misogynistic? Why? What's the historical context for that? And Ash asks, and what of Princess Daphne's husband? And Malik says he hadn't been of royal blood and had no claim to the throne, so he was of little relevance after she died. Wait, what did happen to the husband? I don't even remember. I thought he was dead too. Anyway, he doesn't matter. And then <laughs> Nox says, how do you think the queen has made it this far without anyone knowing she was a witch? Again, this is the same thing, I, the same issue I took in the last world, or in the last book. We know what the Fae are in this world. That's been explained. A witch got brought up randomly halfway bet between like ha halfway into the last book and I have no understanding of what a witch means in this world. Does that just mean that like anybody who has an unexplained power? What does that mean? <laughs> like are witches their own race? I, what? What? You if you're gonna do witches, do it. Like, I wanna see it. But what, what are we doing? She says, how many of those around her were witches in possession of small magics? She had thought Millicent just a wicked woman until the woman had taken off her long black glove in the carriage and touched her with death. So if we're, are all the small magics to do with like a, like a, a disability? Like, I, I, I genuinely don't know. Like, you really have to define these terms if you're gonna throw them around. We're two books in at this point. Should have been explained. She's talking to Ash and Malik. They're trying to go find Amaris, I guess. I don't really remember what they were doing in the beginning. What they were doing in the beginning is not where they end up, which we will get there. And she was thinking about Malik, who is like, you know, a sexy man in her vicinity. And of course, she has to differentiate this sexy man who would go to a brothel versus one who would not go to a brothel. No, she was confident that Malik would ne not be the sort to frequent establishments like the Selkie. There was a goodness about him that made her certain his feet had never darkened any such doorstep. At no point in this series has sex work been deemed something good and those who seek out the services of sex work been seen as just somebody going to get something that is really all not, not all that different from a massage. As long as both people are consenting to it, there's not a problem with sex work, but nowhere in this series has sex work been depicted as good and those seeking the service depicted as n uh, anything other than bad. So I'm really confused how this is like empowering for sex workers. 
she uses her charm to get where they need to go constantly and they really want her to reveal like okay you have a power right what is it and she doesn't want to tell them because she's considered to be a person with like an evil power as much of the dark fae are considered which dark fae is later explained to be a slur essentially and they ask her is your power anything that can help us get into the castle and she says Nox thought of Aramis and his treasury of weapons Aramis is the serial killer captain of the guard guy she thought of the mur men at the bird and pony and how they'd clap their captain on the back as he'd left the establishment with his arm around a true beauty she thought of the smell of the blood of maidens before her as she entered the armory and the sound of the click as she as he'd locked the door behind them no so she just says no and I thought that this was going to lead us on a journey of her finally having a reckoning with is what I do really all that different from what Ar Aramis the serial killer did. I thought that we were going to have a conversation about like gray morality but we didn't so that whole that whole little paragraph felt like such like I, like I don't know what the point was. We switch over to Amaris's POV. This is not like Nox and Amaris and Nox and Amaris. It's really wonky with how it's set up. It's like Amaris for five chapters, Nox for two chapters, Amaris for three chapters, Nox for eight chapters. I'm just, I didn't understand that. Whereas like Furyborn is back to back to back. It's Eliana, Riel, Eliana, Riel, Eliana, Riel. And the cool thing about doing that is because the chapters end so wildly, you're like, wait, I want to stay with Eliana. And then you move on to Riel. And by the time the Riel chapter is done, you're like, wait, I want to see what happens with Riel. Don't go back to Eliana. But then you're like, oh, but that other moment happened. So I think that it's really masterful. Other people just disagree with me about Furyborn in general, but I think that, it, that that was very smart storytelling. Another thing that Furyborn does that I think that the author here could have benefited from was to create a text within a text so create her own books, like not just the fairy tale books, although that would have been really smart to start your chapters with. Similar to like Little Thieves by Margaret Owen also does that and it really makes the whole theme of the story being like dark fairy tale come together. I think that this book could have benefited from having a text within a text to stay on theme within chapters and to make the world that much richer. So we switch over to Amaris and she's talking about the buildings at the university and it says, the buildings were hewn from whatever natural stone broke the earth this far north creating a dark uniformity to the buildings. We just used buildings twice in one sentence. <laughs> okay, somebody definitely edited this. It talks about how people who are fey get allowed to go to the university but humans are sort of like discriminated against. It says it pleased Amaris to know that this was not a university merely for those born with gifts. While the magically inclined were often recruited and studied on the graces of the school, human attendees were required to pay a tuition fee. And she was talking to somebody named Cora and it says Cora said she didn't mind but her mother had thrown a fit amongst the alumni about the discrimination the university displayed by taxing non-magical students and I thought that this was going to ha be like a theme throughout the book but then they when they end up just leaving the university it's just never brought up again so it's just kind of like a throwaway tidbit and Cora doesn't really want to be at the university anyway she wants to do art and it says though creativity rarely pays the bills I'm like pays the bills sounds like really really not 15th century but all right and it feels like we're almost gonna have a have a conversation about capitalism and and then we don't and then Amara says I was also given a specific path to make money my fate had been decided for me she's talking about being a sex worker but it basically is human trafficking it is human trafficking because Millicent would have owned her contract I was also given a specific path to make money my fate had been decided for me and it would have been profitable my career had been ascribed without my input and I'm like I why aren't we having a conversation about like forced sex work versus freely chosen sex work I don't understand because there's nothing wrong with freely chosen sex work there really is not okay so Gadriel is explaining to the zoology lady like she was like you know who is Amaris to you and he says I fought with her Fairhold whatever the city they were in and Amaris gets so offended by this they actually did fight a dragon together but for some reason because she he did not call her his friend or something she gets so angry for like several fucking chapters which is completely illogical are you perhaps short of a marble Cora draws a picture of what she sees as Gadriel, which is an, a gimni, a demon, and she says she didn't add that seeing him as a demon might give her a sense of sick satisfaction after what he'd put her through. After what he put her? All he said was that they fought together. What? 
I don't understand. And it's not like this is an ongoing issue where Amaris blows things out of proportion. Like this is just added drama for the sake of drama so that they can make up later. No, no, I'm not buying it. It's too stupid. Like you have to actually create an argument. Cora takes her to the library and she says she was hit with the smell of leather and paper and wisdom. Oh, what does wisdom smell like? That scent. Lilac and gooseberries. But I will say that I really like this description where it says the center of the room was a circular, oh sorry, was circular with a brightly colored mosaic of tiles sprawled on the floor displaying a map of the continent and its kingdoms. That's really fucking cool. <laughs> I really like that. That was a really fucking cool idea. Like there were little tidbits in here that I was like, that's awesome. I, I kind of, I kind of wish she would do more awesome stuff because I might actually, in the future, if she hones her craft, if she like actually expands on her own good ideas, I might actually like a book written by this author. Oh yeah, this sentence threw me. I ended up sending it to my friend being like, what the fuck does this mean, man? Um, so she, Cora takes her to the library and she's trying to look up information so that she can like um, figure out the curse with how, you know, everybody from Roscott looks like a, a demon and a, a Gimney. And she also talks about like reading the records between Fairhold and Roscott. Um, text, she thinks like, should I look up text about the Reavers, yada yada. Should I just read a romance novel? Yes. But anyways, the point is she says she returned her attention to Cora and leafed through her brain as if it were little, little more than a book in the library searching for what it was she wanted to know. And I'm like, that's such a weird, why didn't you use like rummaged? You leafed through, so you, you leafed? I don't, how did you, what? What does that mean? Like I'm, I'm trying to picture like what that, what that would look like for myself. And they're just like, I, I don't get it. That's such a weird, that's a weird word to use in that sentence. If I had baited for this, I would have been like, hey, let's take this out and use rummaged instead. And it tries to have a conversation about like stereotypes and slurs and using like dark fae to talk about the Roscott fae who are literally dark skin because they are again fan casted as South Asian and so their powers are seen as more like demonic and it says surely persuasion would have been listed amongst the powers affiliated with the dark fae even if she herself was not wicked and had no intention of using such gifts for evil purposes because again Amaris has the power of persuasion. Perhaps all these unsavory powers could have altruistic uses or maybe the southern kingdom had been right to herd the menaces northward. It's really trying to have a conversation but it just it's just like really it's like such a simple concept that's being given to us in such a heavy-handed way it's really not doing anything of substance. She then goes on she's still reading and it's just talking about like her reading experience. It says she'd always preferred studying monsters over history but this book was difficult to put down. She was absorbing the primary theme like a sponge soaking up water. Soaked up water. Like a sponge soaked up water. She dragged her finger across page after page, the sound of skin on paper, a fruitless, raspy thing. Despite the knowledge she'd gleaned, she'd scan for one word only, wings. Because Gadriel's wings are just like, just ripped to pieces. She's trying to figure out if anything can be done to fix them, but it's hard because he looks like a demon to everybody else except her. So I was thinking that this was going to be like a very long period of time spent at this university. It's not. So she's talking about him and she says, his wings, he's injured at present, but picture a crow or an angel, the big black feathers of a bird. They were so strong before. And I'm like, wait, there's angels now? First we didn't, we did not see Set a description and an understanding of what a fucking witch was in this world. Now we have angels. Fuck, man. Again, I'm going to reference Furyborn by Claire, Claire Legrand because in Furyborn, angel, there are angels. They are not what you, you and I think of in angels in our world because there is no Christianity. There is no Judaism. So she made up an entirely different understanding of what it means to be an angel. What does it mean in this world where there, again, the religion is not based on Christianity or Judaism. It's based on some sort of matriarchal thing that the author made up. I don't know what an angel is. This is the only context it gets brought up in. What does that mean? Like make your lore. If you, 
this is the thing is like it does not make sense to me that this was written by somebody who apparently has like a degree in folklore where's the lore where is it I can't find it none made up just like random words getting thrown around that have nothing to do with the story have nothing to do with the world are just like touchstones from our world that could have a different meaning and context but we don't know because they never get described or utilized ever so they talk about okay well we'll look up healing avians rather than fey and approach it from a different angle cool so I'm thinking this is gonna go the route of that it's not this is all pointless and so they leave the, the library and Cora says if the answer is anywhere it's there talking about the library all the continents knowledge but then she points toward this other building and says and the tower holds all the continents magic it had been so cheer said so cheerily so flippantly Amara said nothing as the girl dropped her off and so then she remembers something that the priestess at the temple of the all mother said in the last book magic is energy it is neither created nor destroyed it exists before it takes shape and maintains its presence after it is uttered if you find the orb of its physical shape there too will you find your answers and so she had asked the priestess where she could find such a thing and she said the priestess said it is held where all magic secrets are held you will find it there just being cryptic for like no fucking reason other than to make an obstacle and she's like oh the tower holds all the continents magic which I don't really understand that because no it doesn't because doesn't doesn't isn't the magic held within people I don't really like what it mm, I don't get it and again maybe I'm just stupid she's still mad at Gadriel and she's like all she could think about was the sting of how he'd answered the master's inquiries when he'd said we fought together and obeyed she couldn't fight her response was reactionary emotional and something she needed to get over not discussed not discuss her misunderstanding was not his burden to bear but hers to go through grow through so you understand that it was a misunderstanding then why are you still mad if you misunderstood then you understand the actual context so why are you still mad what it was a dry bitter pill she was attempting to swallow I don't know when pills were invented but this is talking a lot about like medicine and stuff and they constantly talk about potions so I don't know where pills got thrown into this uh, what that feels anachronistic the Roscott Faye were not friends Gadriel did not consider her as much as a companion but you just said you misunderstood so so you do know or you don't know that he doesn't think of you as just somebody who he fought together with and obeyed and why is it like why is that a bad thing like it's not like he said I don't know some lady that like was following me around and shit it's really annoying it, he, he said a factual statement and maybe he's just being wary like isn't she supposed to be like street smart since she's you know a not witcher maybe he's just trying to not give information to random strangers from not only a different country but at a university he doesn't know who they report to like what the context of this doesn't make any sense why is she so mad it's 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 a smart move on his part it had been a weakness a misunderstanding a weak stupid hope that she conflated with truth so now you misunderstood by thinking that he was friends with wasn't friends with you what all of this is unnecessary so then they like get into a verbal altercation right and he's like Amaris talk to me and I'm like stop please stop this is not sexy and she says fuck off so he comes to her and puts a knife at her throat listen if you <laughs> if you're gonna do the whole knife to the throat bit I actually have to feel like there's a possibility that the one person is gonna cut your throat you're not gonna cut the throat of a person you just asked to have a verbal dialogue with you to try to understand what the problem is this is contrived nonsense so I don't understand why weapon suddenly got involved but okay he's like how are we supposed to fight together or trust each other if you're building a wall between us how are we supposed to fight together or trust each other if you are going to slice her throat up questions that I would like answered it's just there to like do the sexy thing but you actually it actually has to be rooted in like me fearing that that they're gonna get so mad they're actually gonna cut their throat like it, it's not a Nasir and Zephira moment from We Hunt the Flame like I don't actually think like oh this might end in oh almost it's like a um sir if you're trying to have a conversation why are you suddenly pulling a weapon out like what is this a Karen at Starbucks so he doesn't let her go so she spits on him and he says you're lucky I need you alive she says fuck you and he says if you spit on me again I will cut that tongue out of your pretty 
mouth. See, this would be like, oh no, oh, I kind of want to see what happens if I actually thought that that was going to happen. But the way that this has been set up, the way the dynamic is between them, I don't think he would ever do such a thing. So I'm not fucking worried about it. And like, if I were worried about it, that would raise the stakes and make for a better reading experience. But I don't have a single doubt that this will not end like that. And that's a shame. Like it could have been written that way, but it wasn't. And it says, all she was to him now was someone he had fought with and obeyed. All she'd been before that was a set of purple eyes able to see the fae. She had every right to be angry, and she clutched her resentment tightly to her chest with a bonfire of emotions while a bonfire of emotions burned pink, red, and violet within her. A bonfire of emotion. Interesting. <laughs> she had every right to be angry. I disagree and I don't even think that she believes that this would make more of an impact if I actually felt like he had done something a little bit shitty and that she was a little bit right and a little bit wrong I would feel like conflicted and sort of in the middle and that would be a good place to be as a reader where I'm like oh I kind of wish she'd punch him in the face but oh I kind of wish they'd make up At this point I'm like they're just gonna they're just gonna fuck like I don't like this is a this is a non-argument and they're just gonna fuck so why should I care so then next we move on uh, and she like, oh, I need to break into that building. It said Amaris had played the role of assassin, ambassador, gladiator, captive, and commodity. One title she had yet to earn was that of cat burglar. I feel like, wasn't cat bur burglar very specific to like one dude in like France or something? <laughs> Every time I hear France now, all I can think is that clip. Like you couldn't just say burglar? Why did you say cat burglar? Like that's very specifically about that that dude. So like that's that's connected to our world. I don't know. That's just, that's just how I read. I understand that other people don't don't think that much about it so then she tries to break in and he is also breaking in and she's like ew go back to your room he does not so then in this building this is where it started to feel a lot like calls to harry potter the library scene felt like a call very much to the name of the wind by patrick rothfuss but the light the the tower scene where we're talking about magic that's where i'm like this is feeling so much like harry potter and i wouldn't call it like i i definitely would call the last book like filing the serial numbers off the witcher this more feels like callbacks like similarities but I wouldn't call it like beat for beat because the characters are not the same the characters descriptions are not the same the relationship between the characters is not the same so it's different and I wouldn't call it like filing the serial numbers I would call it kind of like oh I like this thing and I'm gonna put it in my book and I'm like ah I see what you're doing here but maybe it should have made it a little different but I, it's I don't think it's it's filing serial numbers off is what I'm saying so this it's not a problem it's just like as a reader who has read Harry Potter I'm like I've seen this before and I kind of wish you'd done something a little different but it's stuff from like book six book five and then book seven like all smashed together anyways oh and book two but later with Knox. i'll get there inside the tower of magics had to be 10 times the size of what it appeared to be from it, its exterior so that's actually book four of harry potter but i mean lots of lots of books did that so again it's not the, it's not beat for beat holy shit i didn't know this was possible the space though vast was not entirely open they had like room to navigate okay so they go up the landings and it says the third landing was simply one large dark pool that appeared to encompass the enormity of the entire level. Neither of them moved toward the lip of the ocean of black water. She flinched as she caught a noiseless splash, followed by a ripple from somewhere in the middle of the pool. What is a noiseless splash? How does something splash noiselessly? How did she catch it if she's not catching it with her ears? You saw it? Water moved, but it didn't make a sound? What? What's a noiseless? What the fuck is a noiseless splash? Like, I just, I'm so confused by that. I said it. I think I, I put it on Twitter and was like what the fuck does this mean like somebody actually described this to me it would have made more sense if it was like she caught movement out of the corner of her eye but couldn't discern what it was the ripples afterwards telling her that something indeed was moving in the water no telling what it was or who that kind of thing so then they climb and climb and climb they like go up all of these levels of this huge tower because it's bigger on the inside man i miss doctor who and so before they decide to go into like the last level she's like oh let's take a break and they're like huffing and puffing and then he reveals to her that he has the power to like deal with law like he's a lock savvy kind of guy. Then we switch over to Knox and uh, Knox is basically just like starting this flirtatious thing with Malik. And I'm like, oh, okay, so she is bisexual. Because in the last book, it seemed pretty clear to me that she was a lesbian. Uh, so she is bisexual. 
cool. And at this point, I'm thinking, you know, you really would have to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go down this path of like cultivating these relationships between Knox and Malik and Gadriel and and Amaris, then like, and and they and at least Knox still has a feelings for Amaris. Is this? Is this polyamory? Is this gonna be polyamory? Because if it's doing polyamory, I'm willing to bump it up half a star. If it's doing polyamory, uh, for, uh, just because I am a, a a girl who loves poly love in books, I will give it half a star just for that. If we're doing that, if we're actually going to, if it's not doing that, and we're just gonna kill these dudes so that they can be together, I mean, why not just like I'm just like I'm I'm very much a pansexual woman. Like I I I'm just like why not more love with all genders? So I'm just thinking if it's poly this gets one and a half stars if it's not poly it's one star so basically they flirting malik's throat bobbed and he hoped she missed how loudly he'd swallowed oh yeah we switched to malik's pov for absolutely no reason uh try as he might he couldn't help couldn't keep the blush of shyness from coloring his neck goddess she smelled good somehow after days of travel she still smelled like fresh plum pie sprinkled with cinnamon as it cooled on the window ledge shouldn't it be on a window ledge what window ledge anyway her very dark lips it's just it's so much food <laughs> this really needed a sensitivity reader again then we get a lot of Knox like witnessing Malik and then the author telling us through Knox's perception how good and kind and great Malik is so it's like all this narration about Malik. Malik was still in his 20s, but perhaps in either in the middle of the decade or cresting its edge, stubble gaze, stubble grace's jaw. He looked at her so kindly. He was truly deeply good at her feet. Ash peered up at her with the golds and reds of autumn. His eyes had always been a gilded glow, his hair the dark embers of a forgotten dying fire. Whenever she'd gotten close to him, she'd been faintly aware of the smell of apples. Isn't Ash also a little bit South Asian? And she was curious that if that might be the gift of the Fae. He was Amaris's friend, her trusted companion. He fought with Malik. He protected those he loved. Knox knew that Ash would have fought for her if the occasion called for it. She knew he had fought for her as much as he'd fought for the Reaver and the villagers and the forces of peace and as he'd slain the spider. Oh yeah, they slew, slain, they, they, sl they, what's the past tense? They, they killed a spider. Okay, this is why I'm not an author. <laughs> they killed a spider. A big old lady spider. <laughs> like that thing from Saga. They killed a spider. Uh, it was it was going after villagers, so they did some witcher shit, and Knox helped. And and she's like, she had no doubt that he would put his life on the line time and time again if it had been what honor demanded. Who the hell are these men? Wait, I thought you said that they were your friends. I thought you said that she had no idea what these t two stood to gain from her friendship. So they're your friends, but you don't know them? I don't understand. Like, what? What is this dynamic? It's just so, it's so shallow. So the whole thing with the spider was funny because, like, at the end, Malik was dying, and she succubus him back to life. She took some of her succubus power that she had sucked out of one guy and sucked it, blew it, into Malik. So she blew Malik in a not sexual way and now he's alive. And I was like, okay, I guess. I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, she doesn't know what her friends stand to gain from being her friends and somehow they're her friends even though they've known each other for like five seconds. And then they find her an axe. <laughs> and she is super good with the axe very quickly. By the end of this book she's like, I am proficient with an axe. Oh yeah, so she has to get rid of the axe like almost immediately because she comes upon a group of men and boys. They heard in a village that there were people dressed up as Roscott men traveling and she was like, oh, they were like, oh, okay, we should go after those people. But they can't be Roscott Fae because then they would look like demons. So what's going on? Who's dressing up as Roscott Fae, Dark Fae, marching around in their uniforms in Fairhold? So she comes upon a group of men. She's like, oh, I gotta ditch my weapon. So she throws her newly found axe away. Don't worry, she'll get another one. She would be best caught unarmed if she had any hope of playing the part of an innocent. Benevolent sexism was an effective tool for defense. Benevolent sexism? Uh, okay. And she comes upon a dude and she's like, you, you, and it's the guy who in the last book Amaris, they had all gotten into like a fight in the kitchen when they were kids and Amaris told them leave and never come back and those kids had literally left and never came back and one of them is now dead and Achard, Achard, Achard 
is uh, walking around with Roscott uniform with a bunch of other young men and literal boys. They have like some cryptic conversation where he like explains where he's been and he's super depressed and she's like, well, what are you doing? He's like, you need to get out of here. Um, you gotta go. So she goes back to Ash and Malik and explains like what they saw, right? What she saw. And they watch all these boys and young men like get up and start moving again. And they're like, where the fuck are they going? They decide to follow them. And it says they, there were no trained soldiers or fearsome warriors. And the boys dressed in Northern clothes were merely conscripted for a single job. Go forth, commit act for Moire and be seen doing it as Northmen. But like, I don't understand, like how, <laughs> even if they're just wearing the clothes, like wouldn't it be clear from like the color of their skin that they were not actually Northmen? What? I'm confused. Like just because they have the uniform on, but aren't like all the people from Roscott South Asian? Or did I misunderstand that? Is it just the royal family? I'm confused. Nox starts complaining and <laughs> she's like, well, you know, they have trained, Ash and Malik have trained to do shit like this and I don't like traveling. And it says, they were quite proud to relay that they had gripped swords in frigid temperatures. They had sprinted through lightning and thunder. They had battled it out in hand-to-hand -hand combat in gale force winds. Gale force winds? Isn't that an anachronism? And she's like, good for you, but I'm not a reaver. And then she complains a bunch. She's like, my feet are so wet. I'm so uncomfortable. I miss my ax. I'm miserable. I'm so hungry. The water is making my shoes rub. <laughs> and all of this is happening, even though... <laughs> so stupid. All of this is happening just so that they can get to where they need to go slower and she can feel bad about it. And they realize that this group of boys dressed as Roscott people are headed for the temple of the All Mother. So the boys and young men got to the temple and they come upon a priestess who is dying and Knox remembers only women were allowed in the temple of the All Mother. This holy space had been sacked by men and the tree of life was ablaze with their destructive force. Men had had done this. Child soldier comes at them and the priestess like knocks him down with a light red and angry as the flames that licked at the tree. What? She barely looked at the child as a light as red as and angry as the flames that licked at the tree was sent slicing from slicing from her fingertips. A light as red as a light as red. Oh, this is my dyslexia. This is the part of the, this is the problem of the book. A light as red and angry as the flames that licked at the tree. Oh, okay. So a light shoots out of her hand, which I had no idea that the All Mother bestowed powers upon a priestess. Uh, uh, this is very, this is coming out of nowhere. Uh, so she kills this child soldier and the priestess tells her Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil and tells her go pick the apple from Yggdrasil, the, the tree. There's an apple hanging from it, which is from the cover. Yeah. So she goes, she gets the apple. The next morning, they're all, the, the everybody's dead except for Knox, Ash, and Malik. And Knox has gone into this like sort of dissociation state said her mind was working however slowly her eyes didn't open her body didn't move her traumas were so numerous she could fill tomes with her tales she had analyzed and intellectualized and detached herself from pain after pain so she dissociates which is the thing she did in the last book when she was whipped in place of Amaris and something she did when she was being sex trafficked and then this was like really I don't know this was just really overwritten to the point of confusion so it says the gilded broken parts of her simply spoke of defiance her slashes and scars as their guilt reflect refracted against the light of her journey merely gave a voice to a truth you can be broken and rebuilt you can endure trauma and in the midst of pain discover strength your wounds have not defined you it is you who have recreated yourself despite them and then it says heroes and ballads glamorized torment in a way she had always found both insensitive and tone deaf <laughs> to the world around them the glorification of pain didn't interest Knox. This would be just another memory in a long line of scars as permanent and cruel as the thin, thin stripes that marred her back. The bodies that littered the temple of the All Mother were not those warriors who had fallen for their country, nor, nor soldiers who had died for the love of their queen. That's still like a shitty reason to die though. These had been villagers whose poverty had conscripted them. I mean, that's normally why people join a military. Money was every bit as responsible for this atrocity as Moire. I'm like, oh, so we're talking about capitalism, but then this sort of just just like fades. So we don't really keep like a consistent theme here. We like pay lip service to issues and then they just drop. 
So they need, you know, time to recuperate after what they've been through. They had to kill a bunch of kids, basically, and get out of a burning temple. So they go <laughs> to the home of a duke who Knox has under her succubus powers from the last book. She gives um, this dude at, like, the, the edge of the, the barrier of, of the duke's lands some money and says, you know, tell the duke that Knox is here. Ash is like, how do you know that he's not just going to take your money and run? And Malik says, you understand, you underestimate the sway she has over men. And it says, yes, the runner could have robbed Knox and never faced consequences. Maybe he would have under other circumstances, but there is a privilege afforded to the beautiful that did not show its kindness to others. Her beauty was a currency as valuable as any coin she could offer. Calling a woman of colors beauty, her looks, her, her outward appearance a, a form of currency. <sighs> She knew it as she looked up at him, softening her eyes with innocence. Is that like this? When the runner had looked upon Knox's face, her glossy hair, her perfect skin with her large, dark eyes, she knew he would not let her suffer. All of this is just giving me the ick. Just... I don't like it. She knew he'd ride his horse hard the rest of the way to Henares, from trot to canter to gallop. It's like Google horse words. <laughs> oh man, this... <laughs> So they do indeed get help and it says the Duke had sent carriages and horses and arm guards and water and juices and bandages and tonics for healing and pain alike all sprinting from his estate the very moment word from her had arrived. Stop! Don't do that! So it says that the smoke like had gotten to their lungs and they needed a healer to take it out and then they stay at the Duke's house just eating food. Knox is talking about eating brie and goat cheese and mozzarella and meats arranged into roses, exotic fruits and berries and breads and sourdough bread and sweet rolls and crack barley and pretzels and honey glaze rolls. <laughs> but she didn't eat any of that. She attempted to nibble at a fig. I'm like, stop. Stop it. Oh, I couldn't possibly eat. How unwomanly of me. <laughs> just once, I want to see a book that has a woman who eats her feelings. But we don't do that because fat phobia and misogyny. A healer was sent to her room to absorb the remnants of the smoke's poison from her lungs. And then she goes to see Malik and sees him naked. And then um, she closed the doors. She's like, oh, let me give him some privacy even though I just saw his dick. And fought her laugh at the walking contradiction of a man. He was burly and sweet. Those things are contradictory? He was masculine and innocent. Again, why are those things contradictory? He was handsome and kind. Huh? He was strong and timid. He was a man and yet she didn't hate him one bit. Honestly, listen, that surprise is a little bit relatable too. Any man who's not my husband, I'm immediately wary of. Like, oh. So the last part, sure, but the rest of it, why are those contradictory statements? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so her and Ash are having a conversation while Malik is like bathing and whatever. And he's like, Nox, I haven't asked, I haven't pressed. Wow, thanks for doing the bare minimum. And even now, I'll ask you only once and then never again if you don't wish to tell me, what is your relationship to Amaris? And she's like, I don't know. And you know what? As the reader, me fucking either, because they don't really have a relationship. They like knew each other as kids and then she dreamed about her for like 10 years and then she kissed her once and she says, I know that I've loved her for a very long time, but why? Like there's no relationship there. The foundation is, is nothing. You knew each other as kids. And they talk about dichotomies and she says, the world is so easy when it's split into dichotomies, it, isn't it? If you're from Fairhold, you can find peace in knowing that the South is good and the North is evil. If you're born without magic, there's a comfort in the belief that witches are nefarious, humans are pure. What the fuck is a witch though? Even as Faye, it's so enticing to categorize one as dark or light. It makes the world so simple, don't you think? Isn't it tempting? Okay, that's heavy-handed, but all right. And then she talks about um, seeing things as like black and white and, and seeing that in people, sort of. And it says, there was a safety in knowing men as my enemy. Hate is a luxury. Do you understand what I mean? And he shook his head. The world is simple when you can bisect it. Everything is so much more painful when it's gray. I actually like that. I think that was less heavy-handed and, and a good way to introduce that theme. And she goes and talks to Malik and Malik is like, so why is the Duke willing to do all this shit for you? Like, why is he so obsessed with you and willing to let you do whatever the fuck you want with his money and his house? And she said, would you believe me if I told you that his enchantment was not because he was human, but because 
because he was wicked and I'm like I don't remember the Duke being wicked I just remember him being like a kind of douchey guy who went and looked for a night at a brothel which like if it was freely chosen sex work then cool but obviously it wasn't so like yeah that's shitty but we're not having that conversation and like why aren't we and it says he took he felt entitled to that which did not belong to him from his people from his kingdom from his friends from his family from women and his final act of taking was when he met me she's like you know the difference between you two is that you do not take Malik, Malik you give and he says you sound like an avenging angel okay then we switch over to Amaris and Gadriel. Okay, so they went into some room where there were orbs, like a bunch of them, and they were like memories. So basically like this scene from Harry Potter. Listen, I don't even remember what the fucking prophecy said. I didn't even highlight it. I think it's all a fucking waste of time. It's just too overwritten, like this entire book. So that was just like another thing that I sort of like didn't store in my memory. And and that's that really speaks to like the writing. Because if I can't remember it, without highlighting it that's a problem like it should stand out it should stay with and he's told her a lot about like how the king was and how the king of Rosca is different now and he used to be better then they end up leaving the university but before they leave <laughs> They decide they need to to go to Roscott and before they leave the people at the university try to convince Amaris to stay because she you know is important and she could go there for free and she's like yeah I'll stay and then they sneak out and I was thinking oh okay so they're gonna be pursued by the people at the university because they really want Amaris for you know doing their work or testing on her or whatever or they wanted they just wanted to keep Gadriel so they're gonna come after them nope that didn't happen missed opportunity uh and just like a waste of time with the whole you should stay and she's like yeah i'll stay and then they sneak out what so then they're traveling and it says he <laughs> gadriel says i've never seen a woman hunt in my life so even Roscoe is like got some weird gender binary gender norms going on why wielding a weapon was both part of country life and a reality of the continent's violence regardless of gender it was certainly easier to imagine women as helpless damsels if one needed to narrow their worldview into binaries but it wouldn't serve him well on the road to underestimate opponents for their gender but like why does he because later in the book there's people in the army that he works closely with that are women and you've never seen them hunt when you're out together that doesn't it just seems like this was an opportunity for us to have like a Amaris talks about gender equality but it's not rooted in like the actual history of e the person she's talking to or the continent again if you don't make like a good understanding of why misogyny even exists at all in this world to tell you like how it presents it's gonna fall apart real quick chapter 25 Amaris had kicked many asses and settled many scores in her time seriously I just wanted to read the part where it said she'd kicked many asses all right she does like beat up some dudes and and she tells them hey you should come with me because I saw an Egimni a, a a in the woods and they follow her and they they see it and then she's like oh run for your lives and they all drop their weapons and then she gets their weapons I thought she took on the role of cat burglar why did she just steal some anyway <laughs> Okay, so Knox bites that apple. Remember the apple from the tree? With the, yeah. So she bites into the apple and she sees a vision whenever she bites into the apple. Here's one of the visions. She sees Daphne, the dead princess, go to the temple of the All-Mother and she has a dead, her, her dead son with her. It says, she says, he knows it's not his son. He knows. It's too late for me. I would ask that the All-Mother show mercy on this land and on my baby, but the kid she's with is dead. So obviously that can't be the baby she's talking about. I would beg the goddess not to let the hate that consumes my mother allow her to win the battle for our lands. I beg the goddess to turn this tide. Please, all mother, send someone. Please, goddess, I beg you, please send someone. Do not let her curse consume us. Send your grace across this land. Protect our child, I beg you. And there was a change, an expansion, a throb of life and power as Yggdrasil, the tree, answered. The priestess's hands had begun to shine with the same light that had shone from the tree itself as the woman prayed above the broken body of the child. The glow was so slowly consuming her body. Daphne coughed again she collapsed her prayers became more forceful she was singing to the tree but this time the tree appeared to be singing back okay so obviously the prince is dead so the illusion is is an illusion the prince is not real so the queen has a fake prince because her daughter is dead and her daughter's child
child was not her daughter's child, so I wonder who could be the child. Then Knox tells a, a, a proverb about everyone being correct and no one being correct at the same time. You have three men who've lost their sight and they all stumble on a dragon. One touches its tail, he feels its scales, and announces that the dragon must be a snake. The second man feels its leg and decides the dragon must be a tree. The third is at the dragon's mouth. The point is none of the men were wrong. It's a proverb on perspective. They aren't lying. They aren't unintelligent. They're just using the information they're given. Their knowledge is just incomplete. And I actually quite liked this because I thought it was a really good way of what they were having a conversation about was like perspectives on religion. And it's not that religion itself is wrong. It's just that, you know, everybody's perspective is so different. And I thought that that was great. And I wish that we would have had that theme throughout the book rather than just, again, it's just one of those examples of like, she had an idea and, and then she paid lip service to it. This did a better job, a better lip service, but it doesn't continue on throughout the book. So that was a little disappointing because if we had really honed in on that theme, that would have been something that really would have uh, spoken to me personally with my background having grown up Fundy. Okay, we go over to Amaris and Gadriel again and they are still bickering. And she says, educate me, oh great one, because they're arguing about information. And he said, I'd like to do more than educate you. Okay. What was that? Flight. We were talking about flight. Our wings are genetic. The wings! I forgot to tell you how that turned out. So all that time spent talking about how to fix his wings and the manufacturers at the university just magically had an answer that they had already built. And they were like, oh, you can use this. The end. <sighs> Anyways. <laughs> Our wings are genetic, like hair color or height. We've been fortunate to have wings come become a commonality among the Fae north of the border if both of their parents are also, also Rouscott Fae. Our wings are a dominant trait. And she said, why don't you call yourselves Dark Fae? And he says, because it's racist, witchling. <laughs> um, you, <laughs> I'll just continue. <laughs> she balked at this. The darkness had been an attribute ascribed to them for centuries. It had been the norm. The norm. She had accepted it as truth. Never for one moment had she considered it. How it made the Fae on the receiving end of the descriptor feel. Her, eyed wi her eyes widened. The white woman was too stunned to speak. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Oh man. And then they, they're they starting to like bicker again. She's like, will you, will you stop dragging this out? I asked several times. And then she, it says she bit off her sentence right before calling him demon. It seemed a little less tasteful after he'd informed her matter of factly that dark fae had certain connotations. This is so heavy handed. Oif! But like calling her witchling is not derogatory, even though misogyny exists in this and it's mostly women who are like, so that you just like, so you're just picking and choosing like what to take from our world and make I just what ah this is stupid so like there's negative connotations of calling him a demon yeah but then as we get to like them being more and more like almost sexual with each other she starts constantly referring to him as animalistic which like the ideas of a white woman referring to a man of color in terms of like animals is not good <laughs> so they're gonna like fight and she said Amaris had never seen him look so primal. Gadriel was more beast than man, the powerful spirit of an enormous cave cat ready to spring on her. He looked feral, bloodthirsty, delighted, the hungry glint in his eye terrifying. Amaris felt the real thrill of threat tingle through her. Something predatory in his eyes sent her adrenaline coursing. It's like, all right, I get it. He's an animal. Rawr. His groans were absolutely animalistic. And he tells her, you have to break my neck. <laughs> Kill me. And she does. But it's so stupid because she, he literally told her, you have to do it. Why would he tell her to do it if he didn't mean it? And then she does, she breaks his neck and she says she realized what she had done the moment the motion was too late. What do you mean too late? You did exactly what you were told to do. And it said she was too, too stunned to move. Again, the white woman was too stunned to speak. One word banged through her mind, shit. She had no idea what she was supposed to do. She gaped at him as her equilibrium floated. Her equilibrium floated? <laughs> her what? <laughs> please, please. Please, d draw me a diagram. 
How does that work? I'm stupid, but I know that that's wrong. Her equilibrium floated. But he's fine, even though his normally bronze skin had taken on a chalky pallor, he uh, comes back from the dead. And it says he moved with phantasmal slowness on the ground. Do phantoms normally go slowly? Don't ghosts like bang around in the kitchen, slam my cupboard doors and shit? Are they normally slow? What does that mean? I have no idea what she's trying to say. Okay. So he had asked her, hey, I have powers, right? Do you want me to bring yours out of you? I can train you the same way we train in Rascot, but you have to agree to it beforehand. She's like, sure. And he's like, it's super, super hard. It's gonna be scary. And she's like, okay. So he wakes her up in the middle of the night, choking her to death. Yeah? <laughs> this, <laughs> this book says at the beginning, hold on, I'll read it for you. This book contains consensual breath play. That's not consensual breath play. He's literally choking her to death. <laughs> But okay. I mean, later there's consensual breath play, but right now, like, if you're gonna have choking in your book and some of it's not consensual, you should probably let people know. Anyway, she, like, explodes, her power explodes from her or some shit, and then he gets, her, she gets him off of her, and it says she grasped with one hand for her sword while simultaneously trying to pull air into her lungs. And because we use the word pull, I'm thinking she's literally trying to pull air into her lungs, and then I realize wait n no <laughs> it's just weirdly worded her throat felt so bruised her chest was hollow and empty and she like pulls her sword on him she gets mad all of this is nonsense right and he's she's he's like he's like that was amazing I've never seen a shockwave I've never heard of this gift it's so impressive bet you didn't know you could do that and then he's like what's wrong with you and she's like you were trying to kill me and he's like you didn't say the safe word <laughs> which by the way was snowbird but it's okay it's all fine because it says she couldn't stop the creeping heat as she thought of how powerful he was how strong he'd been as he stood over her and how it had felt to have his hands wrapped around the tender flesh of her throat with her life <gasps> quite literally in his hands and the deep gnawing conviction that she wanted him to do it again she hated that most of all and instead of like ever having a conversation about like hey I'm confused about these feelings that I'm having where it's like I hate it but I kind of liked it um they just don't talk about it and she stays mad until they have sex and he chokes her. Well, they don't have sex. They fool around. There's no like, you know, penetrative sex because I'm sure we're saving that for later books. Okay, so we switch over to Knox. This is a long ass video, isn't it? Oh shit, I gotta leave to get my kids soon and we're only like 60-70% through. Okay, <laughs> Knox! <laughs> has been using that the the things that she stole from Millicent's office but not as often as I would have liked I really would have liked to see more of the use of the magical um uh I don't want to call them artifacts devices I guess magical thingamajig thing what magical magical thingamabobs and she's like oh I need to talk to somebody but I don't want to talk to anybody around me convenient so she's like I'm gonna use that pen and see if I can talk to the other person and here is where I was like oh this is very chamber of secrets where like Harry Potter writes in the diary but it's not the diary in this book that's the magical thing it's the it's the pen itself and the pen is linked to another pen that and it's like I feel like we could have easily figured out if she had taken five seconds to try to figure out who Millicent would have wanted to contact from far away but instantly gee I wonder if we had taken two seconds to think about it anyway she starts talking to somebody and um this was so fucking weird I need to ask your opinions on three things she asks the person answering men money morality and she doesn't elaborate and the person with the other pen answers her and says I've never found a use for men though I have found use for their money perhaps money clouds my morality but I've long suspected it's those who wish to divide the world into good versus evil who create the con continence problems. There she had it. She was speaking to a morally flexible misandrist. Why are we giving men's rights activists reasons to speak? Why are we doing that? Don't, first of all, misandrist in a fantasy book? Okay. Second of all, morally flexible mis- Come on! And she writes back, I found men's primary use to be their money. Okay. Gee, I wonder who it could be. Who would Millicent need to talk to quickly that Millicent did business with since Millicent Cleary had no family? Gee, could it be the person who was supplying Millicent with girls at the Selkie. Yeah, the other, the person on the other end of the pen line is the sister at the, the mother, the lady, the 
priestess lady. No, the, the nun at the, the orphanage where Knox grew up. I'm going to try to wrap this up because I feel like I've been talking for a million years. So for she she starts to like talk about she she has a this inner monologue again because it's like most of what we have here and it says the first thing she knew was that irrespective of how much time had passed she loved the Reavers Ash and Malik deeply and they cared for her in return <laughs> irrespective of how much time had passed nah you can't fool me into into believing that they have feelings just because you were like well no matter how time how much time has passed they love each other you didn't write that into the book I'm not just gonna believe you you have to actually write it it's the same thing with Nox and Amaris you didn't take the time to cultivate of a actual scenes of them having a relationship you just said it was there I don't believe you um her and Malik almost almost fuck but you know they can't because she's a succubus and she doesn't want to kill him and Knox says to the pen um what do you know about the princess the pen says which princess Knox says both wow it could be three princesses it could be four it could be eight she just says both but magically that's the right answer because convenience and the person on the other end of the line says you know then Knox says tell me everything and she says I'll grant you your answers where your journey began so they go back to the orphanage they get there very quickly and she goes and she's like all right tell me the truth and the matron says to her um matron tells her Daphne dropped you off, you were the princess. She dropped you off, you were the baby, you were the, the princess, and you got exchanged for a little white boy who looked like Daphne's husband so that Daphne could pass you off, uh, pass him off, and, and you wouldn't be killed and, and you would stay alive. Uh, I think she took another bite of the apple and then she sees a vision, right? So, and it says the central figure, there's a person, there's a bunch of, there's the temple, the all mother temple, and there's a bunch of priestesses, and it says the central figure was someone Knox had seen before. It was the beautiful beautiful onyx priestess she had held the night the temple was sacked. She had watched the priestess as two women beseeched the tree on the night of Daphne's prayer. She had witnessed how their hands glowed, how the temple filled with light. Now the priestess lay on the ground once more as she had the night of the fire, her wails of pain joining the songs of the holy women gathered around her. One rubbed her back and a loud agonizing sound comes from her and it was the divine pain of something sacred. Knox understood the priestess was giving birth. So this black woman is giving birth. She is the priestess and this black woman does not have a name. She is the priestess. It says, Goddess, give her strength. The All Mother has chosen you, and the All Mother will see you through this. Look to her. The pregnant priestess screamed. Again, she does not have a name. As the contraction tore through her, that's, I mean, it says, I have been devout all my life. Please, Goddess, help me now. Push. I see its head. Focus. This is like every... <laughs> every birth you've seen in every medical drama and it says she was Bodhi Genesis Yggdrasil she was the branches and leaves and life and memory at the temple's core she was there for it all like Knox was Knox was Bodhi Genesis Yggdrasil in interesting okay so baby comes out the priestess says what do I do now she looked among the branches blah 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 and it says your part is done your devotion allowed you to be the vessel for the all mother's blessing the priestess says am I to raise it and it says the child belongs to everyone and no one we will keep it safe fed and cared for in the temple until the goddess determines where it must go to fulfill its destiny the babe is the manifestation of the prayers of the faithful it says the priestess who gave birth was the beautiful obsidian black of the people of Tarkani the per early babe in her arms was as starkly contrasted as the silver moon outside. Knox didn't understand what she was seeing. How could this baby be born to this woman? Okay. She thought of the priestess again, how she'd been so overcome with the goddess's light when she prayed with the princess in her final moments. It looks so humid, the exhausted priestess murdered, or murmured, for it is and it isn't. Do we tell it what it is? And then Knox realizes that the baby is Amaris. So what ended up happening is Amaris was kidnapped as a baby uh, by the dude who brought her to the matron in the beginning of the first book and got paid. Um, so I just want to like reiterate, a nameless black woman was chosen to be a vessel for a god's white baby. A nameless black woman. I feel like I'm not even gonna elaborate. I just don't think that that's appropriate. And then Knox realizes, okay, Amaris is a god's baby and um, was birthed by this black woman priestess and also uh I am the princess of both Roscott and Fairhold. Amaris and Gadriel go to Roscott and she finds out that Gadriel has sort of been lying to her because they've been kind of looking for Amaris because there was a ma matron sister who talked about Amaris to Roscott and the Roscott king uh wanted her. 
So they go, and Amaris is like sort of kind of in prison, and Gadriel is like, wait, no, she's important and different and blah blah blah. So she gets taken by the King of Roscott somewhere. This guy is like such a wish-washy nothing character, and, and all of this could be resolved with a simple conversation. Seriously, it's that stupid. So Knox also goes, sees Amaris, they like kiss, so basically it's the same as the last book where it's like, we barely get any time with them, but somehow they're in love, I guess. Um, even though they never really hung out. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but then they get separated and Amaris is taken by the King of Roscott who has just lost his mind because he thinks that his son is dead even though he doesn't have a son, he has a daughter, which he doesn't know because again, miscommunication, which is the laziest shit. So he steals Amaris away somewhere and uh, then Knox is like, all right, well, I'm the fucking ruler of this bitch now because uh, technically I'm his daughter and I'm here and she didn't even meet her dad. <laughs> She's like, I am the, the princess of both countries and now uh, everybody I'm in charge. Gadriel's like, okay, I'll just follow you and and then they're gonna go save Amaris. Oh, also Nox's axe um, is named Chandra or Chandra, uh, which is the Sanskrit Hindu word for moon. So if we had any doubt that Nox was not in fact white and is in fact South Asian, I think using uh, the Sanskrit word for moon kind of solidifies it. So again, I don't know who the fuck this is, but this South Asian woman who was originally fan cast as Knox and uh, named her axe after a Sanskrit word for moon. Moon, like her moon, like the, the white girl. Anyway, in the acknowledgments it says, uh, thank you to everyone who's walked this walked with who's walked with me down this winding path to make these books the best they could be. No comment. I have a lot of ideas on how I would make this book better, and in fact, so does Eska and a lot of reviewers who reviewed it. I also didn't talk about the fact that um, the sex scene in this between Amaris and Gadriel was like, there was so much like effort put into her giving him a blowjob that it almost felt like when we contrast it with him going down on her, it almost felt like very male gazey. Whereas like, it, it just didn't, like if we're, if we're writing a bisexual fantasy, yeah, wouldn't we put just as much effort into like women getting head as men? I thought so, but like the blowjob that 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 dude got was like, wow, best blowjob. And then she like, I, I think she orgasmed. Like, I don't know. I can't really remember because like him giving her head was so lackluster. What the fuck, man? And I know that this was supposed to be like, ooh, praise kink because he says good girl. And I'm just like, okay, well, I mean, like he got her into choking by almost killing her and then she realized, oh, I didn't use my safe word and, and I liked it. Like, uh, I don't like this. And then he gives mediocre head, in my opinion. I'm good. So like one and a half stars, I guess, maybe if we're like going the direction of Polly. If we're not, then it's one star. Oh yeah, and when they were having that sex scene, it said the puddle of longing from her own water. The, the, Okay. It also talks about tears at one point and it says the pools were caught by her eyelids preventing gravity's siren song. Okay. Oh and talking about the subconscious it says the wishful swirls of the subconscious. What's a wishful swirl? What? So overall this book really doesn't have like a plot it's just stuff and I, 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 uh, I have a hard time explaining this but it's like there's really no like plot arc where it's like inciting incident and big moment and then the fallout and and the inevitable either conclusion or the inclusion that has like things that taper off into leading us up to you know the next thing that was a sentence that needed work but I don't have notes so I'm doing this on the fly uh, I didn't write anything therefore cannot edit it. See how that works? How shitty it sounds when we don't sit down and go back over our work? That's the problem is that it's it, there's really no plot arc here. It's just crap happening all the time and then the, it, it leads us to having like these ideas that sort of like fling off into non-existence and we don't ever wrap them up or do anything with them like the university or witches or angels or talking about religion and really like getting in in, in depth with the religious stuff or talking about like you know children living in poverty. It's just stuff happening all the time and none of it is connected really to in, in in a cohesive way it's not good also the romance is just not well written in like either I mean the best romance out of all of them was definitely like Ash what Ash and High Romance Rachel what? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm not gonna make that joke. Um, it was definitely Malik and Knox. I thought that they were cute, but then again, Malik really doesn't have much personality bes besides being like, nice muscles. So that tells you something. Everything else is just trying very hard and just not landing for me. We're not taking time to cultivate. We're just trying to emulate what we've seen in other pieces of media. And I don't really enjoy that because then I'm just ending up comparing the two and saying the original's better. No, I didn't see any further Witcher filing the serial numbers off stuff. Some people have said like, oh, the temple kind of with the lady. Uh, I don't feel like there's a connection there. I really don't feel like we did any like stealing uh, stuff. As far as I know, um, um, I don't think we did any filing serial, serial numbers off further. And in fact, our version of Geralt in this book, Odrin, he died at the end. He got his head chopped off. He was there for all of literally 0.78 of a second. What? Actually, I've always wanted to know, do witches ever retire? Yeah, when they slow and get killed. It, it, it meant nothing. It felt nothing. We never took time to cultivate his character or their relationship, really, so it was just meaningless. Anyway, that's all I have to say about The Night and It's... What? The sequel to The Night and It's Moon. Um, what's this book called again? The Sun and It Shake. <laughs> if you want me to read the next one, I can. Um, if not, I won't. Uh, just doing my job. Okay? All right. Thanks for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. I'll see you next time. Bye! And now I have to do a thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons. And those are Allie, Amanda, Ashley, Chris, Claire, Des Robert, Emperor's New Blues, Eric, Harley, Jack and Jill, John E, Casey McKenzie, Kate B, Kate W, Kelly K, Quinn, Lee, Let, Lula, Molly, Mrs. Kittybug, Noku, Rain, SJ, Samar, Scarlett, Shiny, Sierra, Tori, and Zachary. Thank you all so much for being a friend.